Good day, ladies and gentlemen. Today the topic is health and safety representative. And I'm hoping to engage you along the way so that we can then progress to make sure that our work environment can be maintained and sustained in a safe way. 98% of whatever goes wrong at work, this is where we are focusing on, is through this person. But it's never me. Normally somebody else. And ladies and gentlemen, how do we then begin to change the behavior of this person? I think you would agree with me if I say that a person's behavior can be influenced by what that person really knows. Because they say that knowledge and understanding of the risk becomes an important precursor for treatment. That now that I've got the information, now that I have been equipped with the knowledge, now that I can actually go to my immediate supervisor and identify to him what are those conditions which is unsafe, that he must resolve, that he must fix, maybe my supervisor will say to me, Patrick, whoa, 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 you're not here to, to make decisions. Get on with your work, leave it up to me. Or you say to yourself, but Patrick, you know, you're just not good enough. It's actually a scary thought that the way we manage ourselves on a daily basis is directly linked to our thinking process. Because what we shall perceive, we shall believe. Roosevelt says that the best thing that one can do in life, and I'm adding work specifically, is the right thing. The second best thing that one can do in life at work is the wrong thing and the worst thing that one can do in life at work more specifically is nothing. And to that end, I want us to understand that when we are going to bring the value to your company, it's going to be critically important that you as the safety representative have got to have an holistic understanding of the application the implication and the intention of the Occupational Health and Safety Act because that clearly safety representatives will inform what you will do in your working environment. So the Act has got 50 different sections and under section 44 it incorporates safety standards into regulations. And then flowing from the regulations, ladies and gentlemen, one would find your South African Bureau of Standards or South African National Standards. You would agree with me now if I say that the very first thing that one must do is to go out and identify where your hazards are, isn't it? That's the first thing you must do. Go out and identify where the hazards are. Once you identify, the hazards can now be categorized. And then flowing from that, one must now assess the risk. We now must ask the question, what is the chance, what is the probability, what is the likelihood that an employee being exposed to that potential source of danger could become injured? Logic will now dictate that we need to put measures in place to make sure that the workers are not at risk. And this is where the law comes in to your employer and says to your employer, Mr. Employer, this is the preferred legal hierarchy of control. I'm saying to you first, sir, try and get rid of, eliminate that potential source of danger. Failing which? Engineering controls. Typical example would be the lock air device, putting a physical barrier between the employee and the source of danger. Followed by an administrative control. A safe way to do the work and then as a last resort you must provide personal protective equipment as a last resort and just understand that you are going to be part of the management team that will go out and investigate incidents ladies and gentlemen i do not want to belabor this point 
But I think it's just critically important that we just need to understand that you have got a responsibility within your work environment to assist your employer in the identification, the assessment of the risk, and then to establish whether the control measures that the company is going to put out there will be effective at reducing the risk. This is exactly what the law is there for. It provides us with all the information that will equip us to make sure that the work environment can become safe. And in this case, it now gives us a structure in the form of a 16.1, a 16.2, and then you get the employer, this is now your organization, who must now appoint supervisors. And then you get the employees who via a consultation process will elect you as safety representatives. This then constitutes and forms your health and safety committee. Who will then on a quarterly basis engage with your 62, make in fact make recommendations. You guys will be developing policies, procedures to make sure that the work environment in its totality can be sustained in a safe way. And once the employer picks up that the workers are not on board, then the law says to him, you must now enforce such measures as may be interested as in the interest of health and safety. Now, ladies and gentlemen, safety representative, this is for me the most important duty that you need to focus on, that you need to understand. The duty to inform, because it says without derogating from any specific duty imposed on your employer by this act, the employer shall, as far as is reasonably practicable, cause every employee to be made conversant with two things. The hazards to his health and safety attached to any work which he's got to perform. Because how do you know when a person is knowledgeable? How do you know when a person is well versed in? How do you know when a person is so far with? Training. Which means there should be documented training that speaks to the fact that the worker understands the risk linked to the task that is required to perform under his specific job description. And I want you to, un to understand safety representatives. The law says to us as an employee that when you, when we, because we are in this relationship, the law says to us that when we enter into that workspace, we shall take reasonable care for the safety of ourselves and of others who may be affected by what we do or don't do. So, so when you have engaged with your employer in terms of the guarantees and that information is not forthcoming, you can then refuse. And that refusal shall not be seen as insubordination because you're not refusing because you do not want to do the work. You are refusing because you haven't got the parachute. Because you haven't got the rescue plan. That is why you are refusing. And ideally, I want you to understand and I want you to take time out to engage with your staff, to engage with the other employees, that they, their contribution they can make towards the work environment is to make sure that if any situation which is unsafe or unhealthy comes to their attention, they've got to report it to me or to the employer. If any situation is unsafe, you shall report that. Ladies and gentlemen, safety representative, it's not only about unsafe conditions. It's also about other employees, fellow employees. Do, what is the situation currently as we speak within your organization? Does the employee report reckless behavior from a fellow employee? And the last, if you are involved in an incident, you shall report that before the day is done or at least first thing in the morning. These are our duties, gentlemen, ladies, safety representatives, our duties. Our duties. Understand that term duty because that's a legal responsibility that they've got. We could be held accountable 
as already mentioned earlier on, about that employee that was dismissed under Section 14, his legal duty. So just think about it now. If the employer does what he's got to do in terms of the act, and we as the workers come on board, we give our cooperation to our employees, to our employer, what do you think the, the impact it will have on, on, on safety, for example? Surely, there's a benefit for both the employer and the employees when there is going to be compliance. Benefit for both. It will protect employees from the hazards in the work environment. Because the employer has identified that there is a, 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 a machine guard missing on the machine, he puts the machine guard on, which means that the worker is being protected. You've got a working environment free from threats to the employee's safety. Employees that is knowledgeable about the safety aspects related to their work and who view safety in a positive manner. Those are just some of the benefits from a safety perspective. From a health perspective, compliance have got benefits once again both for the employer and the employee, ensuring a healthy and therefore a more productive workforce. Reduce absenteeism rates. The protection of workers in the employment from risk resulting from factors adverse to health. Which means we are being given a respirator instead of a dust mask because the employer has evaluated the level of exposure. And now he's providing you with appropriate personal protective equipment in that respect. So purely just, just, just from a, a safety, a health the environment and the, and the production perspective, compliance have got a positive. Compliance is positive. Non-compliance is negative on those aspects. And on top of that, it attracts a fine of 50,000 rand, or you can go pick up soap for one year or both such fine and or imprisonment. And for that, I want us to now to go to section 38. And section 38 speaks about offenses, penalties, and special orders of the court. Ladies and gentlemen, you know, just, just, just think about it for a minute, man. Now, I think, safety representative, you should have a better idea now in terms of the roles and the responsibilities of, of all the role players, because it's only two people within an organization. You get the person that gives you the instruction and us as the worker. So now, safety representative, now that you've got better insight, now that you've got better insight into the roles and the responsibilities, I think we can now move on to model two about your designation. And section 17 now says, Subject to subsection 2, every employer who has got 20 or more employees at a specific workplace shall then within four months after commencement of this act or after commencement of business or as soon as the number of employees exceeds 20, as the case may be, designate for a specific period of time a safety representative for that section of the workplace. So, the law says to you now, as the employer, you've got to appoint safety representatives. But you cannot appoint safety representatives because it says to you, subject to subsection 2. And subsection 2 now further says that an employer and the representatives of his employees recognized by him, which means a union, or where there are no such representation, the employees shall consult in good faith regarding the arrangements and the procedures for the nomination or election, the period of office and the subsequent appointment of safety representatives. So that is what it says. So what do we need to do now? Which means we need to consult with our staff. We need to set a date for this election process. We need to now formalize, we've all voted before, so that is a typical type of process that we must now discuss and engage with our employees. 
And so now my question to you now is that who sent you here, who enrolled you, or who sent you here on this specific, for this specific, was it management, or was it because the employees nominated you? It cannot be that you are a safety representative that was actually nominated by the employer to represent the employees. That just cannot be. That just cannot be. There's also a sense that I sometimes get with the interactions of with a safety representative or employees by and large is that the workers are never uh, the workers are never interested in safety matters. But remembering, ladies and gentlemen, workers are never interested in safety matters. Section, what does section 14b says? As regards any duty or requirement imposed on your employer or any other person by this act, cooperate with such employer or person to enable that duty or requirement to be performed or complied with, which means therefore that the employee have got, have got no say in this matter. Because your function under section 18, subsection 1c says, in collaboration with the employer, examine the causes of incidents. Can you see how it ties in? The duty imposed on your employer and how it actually speaks to your functions. Because what the law wants to see happening within the work environment is for a collaboration, for the employee representatives to be part of the team that investigates incidents. The minute you have got a source, try and link that source to a regulation. So in this specific incident, we had a forklift that was leaking oil. Okay, so now where do we where do we link? Where do we find the link between the forklift and the regulation? And you will find that in the driven machinery regulation. There's three things that prevent incidents: inspections, regulations, and standardization. An inspection is a valuable tool, but it must be measured against what you know. You cannot inspect something and you're unaware of how it should be. So for now, for now, what I want you to do and also understand ladies and gentlemen and safety representative that whenever you are picking up stuff that is wrong in your work environment on that inspection form, take it immediately to your supervisor. So those safety representatives are your functions. A, review the effectiveness of health and safety measures. B, identify potential hazards in the work environment. C, in collaboration with the employer, examine the cause of incidents. And then obviously conduct inspections, and then you raise uh, general concerns to the health and safety committee or to your supervisor. And so therefore, my advice would be for you to make sure that the minute you are being informed of, you must take a camera. Have you got a camera? For inspection purposes or for investigation purposes, or for accident purposes. Have you got a camera for that? Because that is where you can take photographic evidence of the scene, of the tools, of the equipment, anything and everything involved in that unwanted event. And now I want you to read for me section 13b. Inform the health and safety representatives of inspections investigations or formal inquiries of which you have been notified by an inspector and of any application made for exemption under section 40. Let's for argument's sake say that the employee comes to you as the safety representative, informs you that the brakes of the forklift is not responsive, you don't act upon that and worst case scenario an employee is being killed as a direct consequence of your failure to act upon that information. Now, the dependence of that disease cannot now civilly sue you as a safety representative. So just understand from that perspective, the law then protects you from any civil liability only because you fail to do anything which you are required to do in terms of the act. And that Safety representative is the difference between functions and duties. 
because with duties you've got a legal obligation but with a function it is just something that you've got to perform however if you do not conduct the inspections if you do not investigate incidents and if you do not pretend identify potential hazards it could have a negative impact on that so just understand safety representative the role that you play is critical the role that you play is fundamental the role that you play is adding value to your organization because by virtue of what you're doing identifying hazards conducting inspections investigating incidents so you are playing a very critical role So let's move on to the health and safety committee then. Section 19, subsection 1 says that the members meet in order to initiate, promote, maintain and review measures of ensuring the health and safety of the workers. So let's say there are five management members sitting on this committee and you are only four worker representatives. And we all know what happens at a committee. The worker will raise the concern, the management will, will then deliberate on that and then they would come up with a suitable recommendation for the concerns that was expressed by you, the safety representatives. So now it's important that you need to understand, it says that the committee must make a recommendation to the employer. It doesn't say management must make a recommendation, no, it says the collective must make recommendations to the employer and then your other function is that you shall discuss any incident which means any incident that affects the health or safety of the workers that is what you shall discuss we're not talking about money here only health and safety issues shall be discussed anything with the potential to cause harm and then obviously your last function is record keeping which means there must be records kept of each and every incident, of each and every recommendation. In fact, those are the information that you need to make visible to the inspector when the inspector comes onto your premises. Remembering now, you are seated opposite the management team now. So depending on, depending on the procedure at the committee itself okay that is being predetermined but generally speaking the safety representative would have to make his first representation the minute you are going to speak to management never ever make eye contact with that specific departmental head don't do that because the minute you make eye contact you know him Okay, you know that he's in charge of that specific department uh, where the concern is coming from. But don't make eye contact with him. Because the minute you're going to make eye contact with him, remembering there are other managers sitting there, he will feel that he's now being marginalized. It means that you are now beginning to question the way he manages his department. Always make eye contact with the chairperson when you speak you speak directly to the chairperson so safety representatives i think before i'm going to thank you but this is really the end of our session for today we've looked at the the occupational health safety act the objectives the different role players within the your work environment conducting risk assessments providing such information training and instruction that may be necessary and then making sure that nobody performs work unless that person has been given the precautionary measures and then enforcing such measures as may be necessary in the interest of health and safety and then work must be performed under supervision and last but not least that each employee has got to be given a job description attitude Einstein yes I think so that says anything that is everything is a relative how relative is this 
A good attitude should be 100%, isn't it? And our luck is about 89%. Hard work is 49%. But attitude is 100%. That is exactly what needs to happen. If we want to make inroads in our organization as a safety representative, we need to have the right attitude. Now that you've got a sense of understanding or a better understanding in terms of what needs to happen within the work environment, you should be okay. And you need to make sure that you raise those issues with the appropriate management team so that we can then collectively make those changes that will make sure that the company will prosper. So that we collectively make those changes so that we can make sure that the people are developed, that our staff is being given the necessary information so that they can take care of their own safety for the, for the better good of our organization. And for that, safety represent, I want to wish you well. May God bless you. All of the best. Bye-bye now.